Welcome back to Contemporary Black Voices Hot Topics. But before we get mm. to hot topics, we have a new segment we've developed simply because we're getting such great comments from you all. So we've decided to do a mailbag where we pull one of your comments and we will relate to it for the first part of Hot Topics. So the first one goes mm -hmm. to Caleb Alexander. Okay. <laughs> all right. So is he going to put it on the camera? Okay. So uh, last week we had a, a really interesting discussion. Uh, that discussion was about uh, Asians, uh, uh, Asian uh, attacks uh, on a, uh, we called it, what was it, what we called it, Asian attack on black America. War it was a war, Asians war on black America based on the, uh, the lawsuit uh, that went up to the Supreme Court that reversed affirmative action. And so uh, we, as a result of that, uh, of that uh, topic, we got a lot of really uh, interesting feedback. And so I'm going to take, uh, we're going to take the opportunity in this new segment to uh, just uh, read uh, one of the comments. And so uh, the comment that I wanted to, to address, uh, so during that segment, we had mentioned that, uh, it was uh, black folks that were responsible uh, uh, for uh, the civil rights. It was, and without black folks' struggle, uh, the Asians wouldn't be able to attend those institutions anyway. And so we uh, also talked about how black, how the rest, how other communities benefited from uh, the black struggle during the civil rights movement. And so we had a, a comment that came in from Felix Hernandez, 5832. And uh, Felix uh, writes, we Mexican Americans were in the midst midst of our own civil rights struggle in the Southwest, which was primarily supported by liberal Jews and labor activists. To insinuate that Mexican Americans were a Johnny come lately to the civil rights movement and only reap the benefits is not only a false statement, but highly disrespectful. And so we wanted to uh, take an opportunity to, uh, to uh, speak to Felix's uh, comment about this. And so let me respond to own their mm -hmm. own civil rights movement. Their own civil rights movement. So I guess their own civil rights movement was separate from the larger civil rights movement, which Dr. King started in 1955, late December 1955, when they did the march of boycott in uh, uh, Alabama, Montgomery, Alabama. I was a part, I, I was old enough to remember that. When I saw Birmingham, Alabama, where they were beating up black people. I didn't see Mexicans. Mm -hmm. When they were uh, marching across the Pettus Bridge in 1965, I didn't see Mexicans, did you? <laughs> I didn't see any at all. I saw, I see, I saw Jews, I saw uh, liberal whites, and, and mm -hmm. I saw uh, those, uh, and Catholics, some Catholics, white Catholics were involved. Mm -hmm. I didn't study. I, I, in fact, I wrote a novel on that period. And in all mm -hmm. my research, all my research, I have never come across any Mexican that was mm -hmm. arm in arm with Dr. Martin Luther King. So uh, we're not being disrespectful, my friend. We're telling the truth. <laughs> well, let me say, um, in respect to Mr. Hernandez, first of all, Thank you, and we're glad for your comment. However, civil rights and the movement that we have is not segmented, in my opinion, should be into different uh, races. Civil rights should be civil rights for all people. And black folks have been the predominant group who's been at the, the butt of what's happened or the lack of civil rights in this particular country. And I think that what has happened and what will happen is that once you get those civil rights for one person, they should be for all people, okay? I don't believe that we segment it into uh, white and black, but blacks, please understand, are the ones who made it where women could have equal rights, where uh, Hispanics could have equal rights, and the different things like that. But it began with the black race and what we were asking for coming out of Zoom. And, and, and the whole thing about our own, you, you catch that word? I caught it. Our own <laughs> civil rights. And, and uh, Chris is a nice guy. <laughs> when he tells me I'm being disrespectful and I'm telling the truth, no, I'm not going to do that. Doc, did you want to? <laughs> you know, um, 
civil rights is a very, very hot topic in itself. And I think all groups want to have some type of ownership of the civil rights movement as it applies to them. But I have to agree with my, my mm -hmm. panelists that my people mm -hmm. were the persons who put their neck on the line for this country so that everybody can get civil rights. And so you never hear a black person saying, we're fighting for our own civil rights. So Mr. Hernandez, the fact that you're mm -hmm. saying that, you're, that you guys were fighting for your own civil rights, kind of goes against mm -hmm. the overall argument that mm -hmm. we were trying to project. Absolutely. Right. And so just my take on it, just from the research that I did, um, and so I understand that there was a, uh, there was a, like a Chicano movement, uh, and there was the Zoot Suit movement, uh, and uh, those movements were post civil rights. And so, uh, even when you had the uh, the black, Brown Berets, uh, and so all of those movements came that were post civil rights. And so, uh, we're familiar with uh, uh, Mr. Tiarina. We're familiar with uh, Dr. Rosales. Dr. Rosales is a good friend of ours. He's a good friend of the show. And so, we are familiar with his contributions. Uh, we were familiar with the uh, the. Uh, the the farm the the farm worker movements we're we're familiar with the the Cisa and 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 the Chavez movement and so we're familiar with all those movements and a lot of those movements were farmer rights and economic movements and so uh, when you talk about the uh, the uh, uh, the poor people's march and stuff like that those are all post civil rights movements. Absolutely. And so when you talk about civil rights, we're not talking about 67, we're not talking about the brown movements of the 70s, we're not talking about the, the Azteca movements or, or any of the, the, the Latino pride movements that came. Uh, these are all post-civil rights. Foundation. Right, right. So what we're talking about is the foundation. Yeah. Uh, and so we're talking about the, the, the Voting Rights Act uh, and we're talking about the, uh, the Civil Rights Act. And so uh, those, were, those did precede uh, the movements that you were referring to. And so again, uh, it was the, uh, the it was black struggle. Uh, it was black folks that put their lives on the line. Uh, it was black po folks that were bitten by dogs and washed by fire hoses. It was black folks that ended up in those swamps in Louisiana and Mississippi. And so uh, we we understand uh, your pride, and, and we understand that you want to highlight the contributions of your of your of your people, which is and that's fine. But uh, again, we we uh, we just want to uh, uh, address that issue. And again, we stand by our statements that it was our people who, uh, who primarily uh, led the rights for, uh, uh, led the struggle for civil rights for all in this country. And with that, let's jump into <laughs> hot, hot, hot topics. Okay, but I want to mm -hmm. say that we don't disrespect anything they've done. Exactly. And, and so that's why I made the statement, he shouldn't call us being disrespectful because we respect what they did. Right. And I wish that he would respect what we're trying to give out on this panel. And mm -hmm. with those words, <laughs> let's go to black, <laughs> black robes covering white cheeks. <laughs> and so, yes, that is our metaphor, folks. Uh, we we know that they, we, we believe that there are some white robes underneath those black robes of the Supreme Court, in case you don't understand that metaphor. So, uh, yeah. Again. <laughs> okay, first they, they went to uh, the KKK has been replaced with uh, mm -hmm. people wearing suits. Isn't that okay? <laughs> yep. They're wearing suits now. Yep. Now we can say not only are they wearing suits, but the people on the Supreme Court are wearing black robes, but under that we know yeah. the white sheep. The white, and the look white at robes. what they're trying to do. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and, and the most pathetic thing, you know, I have to say that. Is that Negro? <laughs> I won't go into it that. That Negro. Is he, well, a white, is he wearing a white? He is. You gotta, <laughs> yeah, you gotta remember. He's got a white you, robe on. You gotta too. remember there was a black person who infiltrated the uh, KKK. Mm -hmm. You know, he was a. Uh, uh, they did a movie. They did a movie. Yeah, he was a but reporter. The, but the difference, he did it for the right reason. Yeah. Uh, Clarence. He uh, liked it. He stayed. He loves it. <laughs> he, yeah, okay. Uncle Russ, he put Ruckus that he put the white robe on. He said, huh. <laughs> Do you think, let's talk about that. Do you think he would have upheld the anti lynching bill on the Supreme Court? No. The Supreme Court? No. You don't no. think he would? No. He would have said, we don't need it. And while people get lynched. While people get lynched, he would probably say, we don't need that bill. Yeah. Yeah. 
<laughs> we don't. What was his, his arguments were that um, uh, he believes in equality for all. Was that, that was what he hid? He hid behind. And so it, it's the same thing they they hide behind when you people say uh, uh, people say Black Lives Matter and then they they hide with the statement well, All Lives Matter. You know what I mean? And so he 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 he, he kind of hid behind that by saying that uh, he believes in equality for all. You know, but all people's rights under assault are, aren't under assault. And all people aren't being denied uh, entrance into those universities. How can that Negro, <laughs> I don't care who he has dinner with, <laughs> I don't care who he sleeps with, I don't care who he vacations with, when he gets up in the morning, he looks, oh, you said there's not a mirror. Huh? There's no, no mirror. He's a vampire. <laughs> he, he looks in that mirror. He's got to see somebody black. <laughs> you know, there's... Oh, you know, when you start thinking about the, 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 the white robes, and, and I don't know of any, you know, I remember I went down to Savannah, Georgia, and went to the uh, African uh, American Museum down there mm -hmm. and turned the corner. And the scariest thing that I saw up on the wall was a ro was one of those robes. And it just brought chills up my spine. And so it, there's got to be a sense of coldness among the, those six Supreme Court justices to where whatever their personal upbringing was, and I know Clarence, had some issues growing up with black folks, uh, you know, but, mm -hmm. you know, but all of us have had issues with black folks. All of us here on this panel have had issues with, with other folks, but it, is, it has not led us to do some of the things that he has done and is thinking about doing. Um, and the other thing here is that when we start thinking about this particular Supreme Court, I start thinking back to the Warren Court when, when Chief mm -hmm. Justice Warren was over the Supreme Court. And that was a Republican-led mm -hmm. Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. But these were the, were the icons of many of the things that we have, exper have, have experienced today as far as the civil rights, voting rights. You know, all that happened under the Warren Court. Law made a difference to them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, they, and, and they researched. They researched. And those, the, the, I, I'm going to stand by this, the affirmative action case, and they used a Asian person to, to, to move that, their mm -hmm. agenda, saying that Asians have a hard time getting into the elite schools and getting into Harvard. When you look at the stats, it's not true. It simply is not true. And then we'll go ahead and talk about that case, about the... Uh, the, the website and the woman filed a case against mm -hmm. an LBG, an LBGTQ couple saying supposedly. that, well, I have to say supposedly, saying that her religious beliefs prevent her from wanting to do business with them. Well, everybody knew that that was a fake case. The couple did not exist. In fact, the couple that existed were, was a heterosexual couple who they used their address to uh, support the case, but it was it never dealt with a, an LBGTQ mm -hmm. couple. And so uh, Justice Kagan came out and said that the actions that from her perspective, and we might as well throw in Justice Jackson based on how she really led into Clarence Thomas, was that their actions are delegitimizing the, the, mm -hmm. the purpose of the Supreme Court. And let me say something about that. Um, when you bring up Earl Warren and, and their court and what those Republicans were like then, the challenge always was, is can black folks or bringing up an argument against the Constitution or the law of the land, could you make a sufficient argument to put in front of the Supreme Court? And, no, no, back then. And being able to win, okay? If you were able to do that, that particular court would give you the uh, respect 
of being able to put on a good case like uh, Thurgood Marshall did when, when he presented his case. Mm -hmm. The court today is saying, the hell with the law. This is what we want to do. You don't have to have standing. You don't have to have this. You don't have to have that. We're just going to make a ruling because we think it was wrong. And that's where the differences to me come in between the courts is because what you have now is these people are justices, but they're lawless. They drink that milk. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> somehow it seeped over to Clarence. He drank that milk. Okay. Even Amy Coney Barrett asked the question in the oral arguments, mm -hmm. shouldn't you have to bring, if, if this is, and it was about the website case, mm -hmm. if, if these people are the ones who are suing, why aren't they bringing this to the court? And the state of, I think it was Missouri, the state of Missouri said, because we are the state, and, and she's saying, no, if they are the ones who are suing, then they should be the ones who are who are here. Mm -hmm. But they threw, the court threw all of that out and said, it's still okay. Because the court, you, you know, we need to make a distinction between laws and the court interpreting the Constitution as it relates to those laws. Mm -hmm. Because the law is made by 51% uh, majority mm -hmm. to make a law. If you else you need. That happened in the South all the time to us. Mm -hmm. All the time. They pass a law you can't ride in the front of the bus or you can't go in the front. That, and I only took 51%. Mm -hmm. What stopped that was the Constitution. The Constitution comes in and says, that's not constitutional because mm -hmm. the Constitution is there to protect the rights of the minority. Mm -hmm. Democracy says that it's the majority rules. Whatever they want to do, boom, they can do it. That's democracy. And people don't realize that. Mm -hmm. What holds back on that is the Constitution says, no, you can't. Mm -hmm. Because there are rights that this minority has. Our problem with this court is that they've taken the other position. They've taken the other position. Mm -hmm. And they're making it okay for you to have these, these laws where you can uh, say, uh, let's take doing away with the voting rights. Mm -hmm. Where they upheld that bill, I think it was in 2012, where they said states no longer had to uh, get the approval right. of the court right. for their uh, when they when they vote on yeah. voting rights legislation. Now they open the door yeah. for all these states to do what they're doing. Right. And, and so that's the, that's the danger of this whole thing, man. Right. Is you don't have that court that's going to, under the Constitution, protect the rights of the minority. Mm -hmm. that's, well, that's you know, what's interesting, I, 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 it was really a pleasant surprise when they did, when the court did uh, five to four rule that basically gerrymandering was wrong. So mm -hmm. now if it was in Mississippi, it was in a case in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And so now uh, it's setting the stage where states are going to have to go back and reset the, those, uh, those maps mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. where minority groups can vote. Mm -hmm. So uh, this whole thing about the Supreme Court I think the only saving grace that I see about the Supreme Court is that eventually some of those folks we know are going to have to die. Hopefully, the replacement people will be Warrenish in their thought. I'm talking about Warren Court right. in their thought to where, since we already see that the Supreme Court is not beyond eliminating precedents. Maybe we'll get a new court eventually who will come back and say they're resetting this back to the way it should be. Okay. Right. With that, so with the that court thing, has... Go ahead. No, because I'm saying the, previously the court has always expanded rights. And so now you have a, a, a very politicized court uh, that is uh, it's restricting rights. And so this, this highly pol politicized court, it's just, it seems like their cases are being curated to go before the court so they can go through their checklist and, and it's, it's just, it's a... It's a Republican uh, uh, dream list that they're checking off and, and, and uh, reversing cases uh, that the Republicans have, have, have always wanted to reverse. And so, I, me, I do question uh, the legitimacy of this court. And, uh, and the reason I question the legitimacy of this court is because the United States president was not allowed uh, to, uh, to uh, pick a Supreme Court yeah. judge, which was his, uh, his, uh, right. his constitutional right. 
And so I do question, I will forever question the, the, the legitimacy of this court. The other reason I question the legitimacy is, of this court is because I, I believe that the president uh, that did come in prior to this one, uh, I believe that there was some election, the, uh, electoral interference. And so I, I, this court may not be a Trump court, it may be a Putin court. And so there's several reasons I question the legitimacy of, of this court okay. and the rulings. Well, I think with that, we're going to end it, okay? Mm -hmm. Let's get our final comments and start over here. Chris, I know you think we talked about today. I just think as far as guns are concerned, uh, we are going to have to, as a country, really deal with this issue and deal with it in sincerity. Uh, if we're going to be civilized, we're going to have to have a position that is more uh, favorable to the people. Mm -hmm. sure. Instead of saying, well, what about black on black crime? <laughs> I say, well, what about crime in general? You know, that's mm -hmm. what we should be talking about if we really want to, to do something with this gun violence. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's see, so I know, I just want to mention this, folks. If you if you uh, get to take a look at this video today, tomorrow, 10 a.m., Carver Library is from 10 to 6. And so they are having a, uh, a HBCU send-off uh, for the uh, for the kids that uh, that got accepted and are and that are leaving uh, and headed to to HBCUs this fall. And so if you could come out, celebrate with the kids, congratulate the kids. If you're able to donate, it's 10 kids. If you're able to donate. Please do so. Uh, you know what kids need when they head off to college. And so let's just, let's celebrate this, uh, this achievement. Let's celebrate our gra graduates. Uh, and so not to take anything away from kids who are, are not going to HBCUs, uh, but uh, this, uh, that, that'll come at another time. But at, for, to for today or for tomorrow, rather, let's, let's celebrate these kids. And so it is 10 a.m. It starts at 10 a.m. Uh, there, there are going to be a variety of events. There's going to be, um, let's see, I know there's going to be food vendors, other vendors that are going to be there. And so just come out and have a good time. I think they're going to have a DJ over there. And so they're really, they're really doing it up for these kids. And we're really going to celebrate these kids. And so um, it's 10 to 6. And, and so is there I really, a flyer or any place where people uh, can get it's more gonna information? Be, it's going to be at the Carver Library. So you can look on the Carver Library's website. Uh, you can, Facebook. yeah, you can look on the Facebook site for Carver Library. And so, uh, yeah, again, like I said, I just, I want to, I want to celebrate these kids and their accomplishment, especially in, in, in the face of what's, what's, what's recently happened. So we are really going to have to, 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 uh, gather around our, our, our HBCUs, our, inst our institutions. Uh, we know the reason that our institutions were founded. They were founded because of situations like this, but we have to educate our own. And so again, let's celebrate these institutions and let's celebrate these kids that are going to these institutions and just come out and provide your support, your love and support. Okay. We need to love on each other. Okay. Great show today, folks. Thank you, thank you, thank mm -hmm. you. We're looking for your comments, uh, good or bad, beautiful or ugly. <laughs> we, we welcome your comments. And we will definitely be back with you next week, Contemporary Black Voices. In the meantime, we are telling our story our way. <laughs>